Today, I want to tell you about virus structure. We're going to talk about how viruses are built, what they're built with. And just like every other part of this course, I'm going to try and emphasize the principles. So even though there seem to be lots of different kinds of viruses and shapes, they're in fact only built with a couple of different principles in mind. And I want to explore those and really simplify uh, how they are built. So the proteins that make up the part of the virion or virus particle that surrounds the genetic material, we have different names for that, we'll, we'll get to in a moment. They have a very important function, that's to protect the genome. So they have to form a protective shell. They have to be able to interact with the nucleic acid specifically because you don't want to be putting cellular nucleic acids into virus particles. That would be a waste and it wouldn't lead to more infections, of course. Uh, and then in some viruses, um, the proteins have to interact with the cell membrane, as you will see, to make an envelope. And we'll, we'll explore what that is a bit later. So that is sort of a protective role. The proteins that make up the particles also have to help deliver the genome to the cell. They have to bind receptors. They have to help uncode it. The process by which the nucleic acid comes out of the particle into the cell is called uncoding, and we will talk about that next time. And it may involve fusion of viral and cellular membranes. And then finally, the genome has to be brought to the right place in the cell. And that transport is often carried out by the interaction of structural proteins in the virus particle with the transport machinery of the cell. So a number, many different functions embodied in these structural proteins. So they're really, really important. And here's some definitions that'll be important as we move along, okay? And again, I wanna tell you what I feel these mean. We start with subunit which is a single folded polypeptide chain that makes up a virus. So here in this virus particle, these blue and yellow and red proteins, they have VP names, those are subunits. They're single proteins that are folded up in a certain way. And they make up the viral capsid. The structural unit, and you also will see in the literature, this called the protomer or asymmetric unit, but I will use structural unit, is the unit from which the capsids or nucleocapsids are built. Now we haven't defined those yet, but these are the building blocks of the virion or the virus particle, and they are made up of one or more subunits. So we started with subunits. You put one or more of those together, you get a structural unit. So here in this picture on the upper right, the structural unit would be one blue, one yellow, and one red subunit. So multiple subunits form structural units. For many viruses, we say, there is a capsid surrounding the nucleic acid. Capsid is from the Latin for box, and the capsid is the, the protein shell surrounding the genome. In some cases, we call it a nucleocapsid, or core, and that is typically the assembly of protein and nucleic acid within the virion. And I'll show you some uh, nucleocapsids later. There's one right here on this slide. It's not very big. It's the RNA genome covered with protein. That's the nucleocapsid, and we'll get more into that later. Then there's the envelope, which is the membrane around the virus particle, and this is always host cell derived. The, not all viruses have envelopes, but some of them do, and we'll see that as well. And finally, the virion is the infectious viral particle. The virus particle is not necessarily infectious. This word implies infectivity virion. So just before we move on, just so that you remember the size and the dimensions that we're talking about here, uh, we often talk about nanometers and angstroms. Nanometers are 10 to the minus 9 meters. And um, an alpha helix in a protein, shown here, is typically a nanometer in diameter. So the smallest viruses are 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter. DNA is 2 nanometers uh, in diameter, shown here in double helix. Uh, a ribosome is 20 nanometers in diameter, and polio is 30 nanometers. And this is not the smallest virus, it's about 20 nanometers, it's the smallest particle. Uh, and a very large virus, of course, is Mimivirus at 750 nanometers, which you can see dwarfs uh, 
polio as well as ribosomes. And then, of course, the Pandora viruses, which I mentioned last year, are 1,000 nanometers, one micron long. You can see them in a light microscope. Okay, so that's just putting size in perspective. Now, a concept I want you to understand is that a virus particle is not an innate object. So here's a virus particle right here, diagram. We'll talk about how this is built in a moment. They're not, they're not inactive particles. They're actually quite active. And we say that they are metastable because they have to have two states. They have to protect the genome and be very stable in the environment. But at the right time, they have to come apart. So under some conditions, they're very stable. And under some conditions, they are unstable. So we call that metastability. And virus particles are actually machines. They have moving parts. They have proteins that move around and do different things in the infectious cycle. So that's shown here. Here on the left is the stable virus particle. If this were polio, this could pass through uh, your stomach and your intestines without being degraded at all. But when virus binds to receptors on the cell surface, it gets taken up uh, into the cell. Its conformation has changed. Proteins move around to make an opening for the viral RNA to come out, and uh, the viral RNA can traverse the membrane. All right, so the virion on the left is very stable. As soon as it gets into the cell under the right conditions, it becomes unstable. And we will talk about the changes that trigger this instability next time. But for now, I want you to understand that a particle, a virus particle, is quite the active machine, and it has this characteristic of metastability. Another way to look at metastability is that the virions have not yet attained their minimum free energy conformation. So if we map the energy of a particle here, y-axis is energy and the x-axis is time, uh, virions, virions, the stable virus particle is number one here. To reach the other state, the free energy minimum state, is number three here, it has to surpass or surmount some energy barrier, and that's number two. And so you have to put some kind of energy into the system in order to do that. So one is the stable particle. It's not happy being there. It wants to get to three, which is the place where it will release its nucleic acid. And to do that, it has to surmount an unfavorable energy barrier. So that's just another way to looking at metastability. I like the idea of stable and unstable. But in thermodynamic terms, that is uh, another way to look at it. So this energy barrier that we have to pass during entry, how do we get over it? Well, it turns out that when you assemble viruses, which we'll talk about later in the course, you actually put energy into them. And that will be released when the virus has to surmount that energy barrier in order to be able to do that. So we say the virions are spring-loaded during assembly. And we put energy into the structure. And then we can release that later on to get over that energy barrier. So that energy is used for disassembly. And again, the cells provide a signal of some sort. Uh, the energy is released, and the virus can get over that barrier. What exactly that barrier is, you'll see when we look at uh, encoding next time. But it's a, it allows the vir virion proteins to move around so that the nucleic acid can get out. So I like to think of this as these toys. My son had these years ago. Uh, they're Japanese toys called bakugan. And they look like viruses, right? If you roll these over a magnet, they pop open, and they become warriors or something like that, right? So the, the magnet is the signal to have the virus change its state, all right? And then it opens up and becomes something else. So you store energy in these by retracting There's some kind of spring inside, and then boom, they pop over. The trigger is the magnet. In the cell, we don't use magnets to uncode viruses, of course. We use things like proteases and low pH and other sorts of activities, but it's the same idea. So when we think about the virus particle, we have two things to think about. We have the structure, how it's built, which we will talk about today, and what it has to do. All right, And the structure is, is a, has a key pattern that we're going to talk about a lot today. It's created by symmetrical arrangement of identical proteins to provide maximal contact and non-covalent binding. So this is the, one of the principles of virus structure. You take one or a few proteins, you repeat them many times to make a virus particle. You want those proteins to interact maximally so the particle will be stable. And you don't want them to be covalently bonded together, otherwise the particle could never come apart. So remember, it has to be metastable. It has to be able to come apart to release the genome. So you can't have covalent bonds there. So that's how the structure is 
is made. And then finally, you have to, the structure has to have a function, which is genome delivery. It can't be, again, permanently bonded together. Uh, and then uh, something happens during infection of a cell to release the genome into the cell. So the structure is built by this symmetrical arrangement, and that allows the function, which is uncoding and release of the genome. And again, it's a metastable situation. You have to be stable, floating through the air from person to person. You can't be releasing your genome in the air because it wouldn't infect anything. But once you get into the right cell, uh, then you have to um, release the nucleic acid upon a signal. All right, so please go to Socrative. And this time I've made sure not to ask you for your name, I think. Uh, let's see here. Lecture four. Okay. So we got virion, viral capsids are metastable because. The answer is uh, all of the above. Um, so there was a scattering of other answers, and particularly number two. Let's see what that's about. Number two, they must come apart and release the genome. Well, that's absolutely true, but they're, they're metastable because they have to be stable outside the cell. They have not obtained a minimum free energy confirmation. They are spring-loaded. So all of those explain why viral capsids are metastable. That's what I want you to, to get from, from this part. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we learn virus structure. There's been a revolution in this in the past 20 or 30 years. I want to talk a little bit about this just so you know how it works. I'm not going to ask you about any of this, but uh, electron microscopy, X-ray crystallography, two kinds of electron cryomicroscopy, cryo-EM and cryo-EM, uh, electron cryotomography, and also nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We'll talk about the first uh, three today. Now, uh, the modern era of structural virology began in the 40s when this German scientist used an electron microscope to um, take the first pictures of viruses. So he invented the electron microscope and took pictures of viruses. This is one of the first EMs made. It shows an E. coli bacterium to which a number of bacteriophages have been attached. So here's the paper. If you speak German, you can go check it out. I've never read it. But in, in Munich, there is uh, one of his microscopes in the, what is it, the Technological Museum in Munich, that incredible science museum. You can see one there. Uh, electron microscopy, you have to stain the materials because cells and viruses don't have enough contrast to see an electron microscope. And typically, you negatively stain them with some kind of electron-dense material. You don't use a dye that we would stain living cells with because the electrons would go through it. You need something that's going to reflect electrons, like urinal acetate, phosphotungstate, and they will scatter electrons. So you're basically shadowing the particles. The resolution is 50 to 75 angstroms, all right? So uh, the alpha helix is 10 angstroms in diameter, for example. Uh, one angstrom is 0.1 nanometers, just to set you up. I've changed from nanometers to angstroms here. So this is not a lot of resolution. We can't see polypeptide change. We could just see the overall shape of the virus particle. And you'll see many, many pictures of viruses uh, taken by EM in online and in books. And these are just a sampling of some very nice ones. Uh, here, here on the lower left is adenovirus, this very cool virus with projections uh, at each end. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, above it is hepatitis B virus, which can exist in different forms. Here's a herpes virion. Uh, this is an influenza virus uh, in the middle. Uh, and th actually, that's not. This is an influenza virus below it. This is a picornavirus, poliovirus. 
Uh, and here on the lower right, we have a pox virus. So you can see very different morphologies. Uh, some of these viruses have envelopes, herpes virus, hepatitis B, uh, the influenza and the paramyxovirus above it. Uh, but many of them don't have envelopes. They're made of pure protein, uh, these viruses as well, and, and the adenovirus. And we'll talk about how those are built. So um, the next step in resolution is cryo-electron microscopy. What you do here is you put your virions on a, on a grid in water, and you simply freeze them. And the freezing gives them enough contrast so that you can see them here. And then you take lots of pictures of each one. You take two to 300 different pictures. The idea being that each particle is in a slightly different orientation on the grid. And then you use a computer to reconstruct the three-dimensional image based on all those individual pictures. It's sort of like a um, CAT scan where the, the CAT scanner moves around a person and takes many x-rays in 360. And then a computer assembles them well. Here it's done for virus. So you take individual particles. You use Fourier transformation. Uh, to display the data, and then you merge them and inverse the Fourier transform to make your particle. So this is an example of a, a virus structure uh, that's been determined uh, by this technique. So the uh, resolution has gotten better and better. It used to be about 20 angstroms, you know, a little better than EM, but still not enough to see individual polypeptide change. You can now get down to about 3.3 angstroms, and it's this is all because of computational advances. advances. There's a new uh, version of this now called cryo-electron tomography. And what happens here, instead of having the grid flat and just taking pictures, you tilt it. All right, so you can look at the virions on different sides. And you make three-dimensional images in the same way. And this is an example of poliovirus plus its receptor. Uh, the virus is in red and the receptor is in green. And the structure was solved by cryo-EM. I think it's about eight angstroms resolution. So you can see shapes of the virion. You can see surfaces and how it's rough. You can see the shape of the protein. It's got bumps on it. These bumps are glycosylation sites. They're sugars. But you can't see the polypeptide chain. And that's only something that you can see by other techniques. So here, for example, is the receptor molecule where we can see the alpha carbon backbone. And that's because the structure has been determined by x-ray uh, crystallography, which is a separate technique that gives you much higher resolution. <coughs> to do this, you have to make uh, crystals of your virus. You have to grow a lot of virus and put them under some condition where they form crystals. All right? And you need a lot of virus, and you have to be lucky. You have to find the right conditions. And some viruses never crystallize. Others do, but they don't give you the data you want. Once you get crystals, you then bombard them with x-rays. And each atom in the crystal will scatter. And because they're arrayed in a crystal, you can computationally figure out uh, the polypeptide chain from that. So in the end, you get a structure of 2 to 3 angstroms. Slightly less, 1.8 angstroms is also possible. You can see the polypeptide chain. And as I showed you in the previous slide, uh, you can see the, not only the backbone, but you can see all the side chains as well as the amino acids. We've just eliminated them for simplicity from this view. Uh, these molecules here uh, off the uh, yellow part, these are sugar molecules. These are the glycosylation sites that you can only see as bumps in the cryo-EM because it's of lower resolution. And some of the images that have been made um, by x-ray crystallography, this was actually the first virus whose structure was determined by x-ray crystallography. It's a plant virus, tomato bushy stunt virus. And of course, it's not red. Uh, x-ray crystallographers, structural biologists love to use different colors, sometimes gratuitously, sometimes actually to illustrate things. But uh, this was the first one. You can see the surface is very rough. Uh, it's not a smooth ball. Um, and here is poliovirus in two different resolutions. Here on the upper left by x-ray crystallography. So high resolution, you can see every atom basically in the, in the virus. Uh, and here by cryo-EM. You can see that the virus has a, uh, a corrugated appearance, but you don't know where the individual polypeptides are. And in the background is an uh, electron micrograph that was used to generate the data for the cryo-EM reconstruction. So lots and lots of virus structures have been solved. I just added this one today because 
This is a um, structure of a virus called Cafeteria Rowenbergensis virus. This is a virus, a one of these huge viruses. I can't remember even how big it is, bigger than anemia viruses. And it infects a protist that lives in the ocean. So it's a crystallographer at University of Texas, El Paso, uh, Chuan Chao, who I met this summer, uh, this fall, and he showed this image. And this is a, this is a um, animation and you have to move every atom in this particle when you make this animation. And there are millions and millions and millions of atoms. It took years for them to solve the structure of this because it's so big. Uh, and he told me when he first started solving it, it would crash all of his computers because there was so much data. So you can get structures on these big viruses, but it's com computationally very, very uh, intensive. Now let's talk a little bit about the principles of building of virus particles. And here, it, for many of them, I would say for most of them, symmetry is the key to putting them together and to understanding. And actually, this whole area was begun by Watson and Crick. You, you know them, I'm sure, for their role in, in solving the structure of DNA. But they also made big contributions to our understanding of virus structure. And a couple of years after their solution of the DNA structure, they pointed out that most viruses that we had looked at so far in the electron microscope were either spherical or rod-shaped, okay? And they also knew that there weren't many different proteins in these particles. There were a few proteins, and they were repeated many times. And they also found that the, the proteins have properties that per permit repetitive interactions among them. And that's something we, we mentioned just briefly earlier. All right, so they had learned all of that in their work, and so what they figured out was that for uh, viruses are made of identical protein subunits, and they are put together in two different ways to make virus particles, with helical symmetry for rod-shaped viruses, and with uh, platonic polyhedra symmetry for round <coughs> viruses, okay? We're going to talk about this now, but this is their contribution because they had to figure out how some viruses were rod-shaped, like tobacco mosaic virus, and why some of them were spherical, yet they seem to both be made with the same principles, taking one or a few proteins, repeating them many times to maximize the contact between the proteins. And they came up with the symmetry rules, which are really important for understanding how viruses are assembled. So there are two rules. First, uh, each subunit has identical bonding contacts with its neighbor. So remember, a subunit is the single polypeptide chain that makes up the virus. So you have identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. And so basically, this gives you a symmetric arrangement. You have repeated interaction of surfaces in the same protein that are chemically complementary. You get a symmetric arrangement. This will be clearer when we show you some pictures in a moment. All right, so identical bonding contacts. Secondly, the contacts are non-covalent for the most part. There are always exceptions in biology, and there's some pretty cool exceptions, but we're not going to talk about those. But for the most part, the contacts are non-covalent. Why? Because you have to take the particle apart to get the genome out. You don't want to have a covalently linked capsid. Uh, and also, during assembly, if you make mistakes, you can reverse them and do it over again. So having non-covalent bonding contacts between the proteins that make up a virus is really important. So these are the rules that came from Watson and Crick's works on particles. So this, this one of the outcomes of this rule, symmetry and self-assembly, which was in the previous slide, is very evident in some of our vaccines that we use today. There are two vaccines, the hepatitis B virus, HBV, and hepatitis um, human papillomavirus HPV vaccines. Uh, these are simply viral proteins that are produced in a culture system, in yeast or in other cells, and they spontaneously fold and assemble into virus particles. There's no virus genome present. We're just making the proteins in these cell systems. But in the sequence of those proteins is all the information that they need to assemble a virus particle. So they interact with one another, and in, in this non-covalent fashion and maximize the contact between the subunits. So we call these uh, virus-like particles because they don't have genomes in them. Uh, and those are the vaccines that are actually uh, used to 
immunize against these two uh, infections. And here's just an EM of one of them. We'll talk about this a bit later in the vaccines lecture. But the point is that these principles of symmetry and self-assembly, which is what we say are characteristic of virion proteins, are used to make vaccines. All right, let's start with helical symmetry. This is the kind of symmetry that's used to made ro make rod-like viruses like tobacco mosaic virus. In fact, here on the upper left is tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, this is a virus that infects plants, the first virus to be discovered. And it's very simple. It consists of a single protein repeated many, many times and an RNA molecule. And here's the protein, one of these brown guys here, the coat protein subunit. Those coat protein subunits interact with each other in exactly the same way, and then they also interact with the viral RNA. So here is the green inside is the viral RNA, uh, and so each uh, capsid protein or coat protein subunit binds the viral RNA and a neighboring subunit, and they form this long uh, helix, basically, which has a certain pitch and a rise and so forth. So that's helical symmetry. Now in plant viruses, that's the whole virus just this naked rod-shaped assembly of protein uh, and RNA. Animal viruses or viruses of eukaryotic cells are also built with helical symmetry, but they're never naked as is tobacco mosaic virus. So here's a preparation at the bottom of tobacco mosaic virus. It's just these rod-like particles. Uh, but for example, a Sendai virus, a paramyxovirus also has a nucleocapsid built in pretty much the same way, a single code protein binding to the viral RNA, except that this is then encased in a membrane. Uh, and that's shown here. This is the, an electron micrograph of a paramyxovirus. And one of them is broken. One of the particles is broken. This is the lipid membrane. Here's the break point. And all the nucleocapsid is spilling out. You can see it's quite long, but it's got this very typical helical shape. Vesicular stomatitis virus is another example. Uh, this is a virus in the same family as rabies virus. It's a bullet-shaped virus, and the bullet shape comes from the way the nucleocapsid uh, is arranged with the viral RNA. All right, so I have these wonderful magnets here, which you can buy, which many years ago, my TA Ashley pointed out, could be used to build a um, helical virus. So for you here in the class, I can show this to you. You, can, you used to be able to buy these magnets. These are very powerful. Uh, neodymium magnets, I think, and you can get them in different colors, but the point is you can make a, a helix, and for those who are not in class, they can watch the movie. Uh, they will all bind to each other. This is a perfect helical nucleocapsid. Each of these balls is the capsid protein, and the magnetic part is each one interacting with its neighbor in an exact way. What, now, what's missing from this? If each of these balls is a protein, what's missing? Yeah, the RNA is missing. So that would be an important part of the structure. But these can be very long, and you can put genes into these viruses, and the nucleocapsids just get longer and longer. So that's, uh, these are called buckyballs. You can used to buy them. I think they took them off the market for a while because kids were swallowing them. Uh, but they may be back again, and here's, here's my thing here. OK, so this is a very nice model to crystallize in your head what is uh, helical symmetry. Now, uh, VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, rabies virus, they're all made with helical symmetry. Uh, again, the, here, this is a schematic of the helix. It's, it's more packed like my magnets show. Uh, and this is encased in an envelope. And that's an EM of the particle. They're actually bullet shaped. So the viral RNA is bound to this nucleocapsid protein, just like it is in tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, here is a single molecule of this uh, nucleocapsid protein, which is what it's called in uh, VSV. And it is binding in this uh, X-ray structure uh, nine nucleotides of RNA. And so here, here is, uh, I think, 10 of them uh, binding RNA. So basically, the RNA genome of this virus, which is negative strand, is just coated with these uh, N nucleocapsid proteins that each bind nine nucleotides of RNA. You see they interact specifically with the RNA. And then when you put another molecule next to it, the second protein interacts maximally with this first nucleoprotein. That's those, those are the two, uh, one of the two components of symmetry. Yes? Um, does this happen with both RNA and DNA? So the question is, do you get DNA coated with protein in virus particles like this? And for the most part, no. The only case where there are proteins uh, binding 
viral DNAs is for the polyomaviruses, which have a nucleosome-like structures. So, you know, our DNA is, is bound to histones as part of a nucleosome structure. And there's only one virus that family that we know of that does that. All of the other ones, as far as we can tell, all of the DNA uh, viruses have naked DNA in, in the particle. So here are some examples of viruses that infect mammals that have helical genomes. That is, they're arranged in a helical structure with the RNA bound to a protein. In animal cells, it's, they're never naked. Remember, tobacco mosaic virus, that helical structure was naked. That's the virus. It doesn't have an envelope. But for reasons that I don't understand, in the animal virus world, all of the helical viruses have an envelope around them. And these include paramyxoviruses, measles and mumps virus. So here's an example, a cartoon of that. Uh, rhabdoviruses, VSV, which I just showed you, and rabies virus. That's the bullet-shaped one. Uh, influenza virus, the genome is helical. It's protein wrap, wrapping the RNA. Uh, the, the filoviridae, including Ebola virus, the same. It's an enveloped helical structure. So that, that's what we're talking about when we say nucleocapsid. The nucleocapsid of these viruses is the green part bound to protein. Nucleocapsid is nucleic acid protein assembly that is packaged uh, within the virion. So for TMV, tobacco mosaic virus, the nucleocapsid is the virus particle. But here it's a subassembly of the virus particle because it has an envelope around it. All right, question two. Which of the following describe virus symmetry and self-assembly? Okay. Yes. So the question is about DNA being naked in viruses. So DNA viruses, for the most part, the DNA in the capsid or the virus particle doesn't isn't coated with proteins as we've seen here. RNA viruses, the negative strand are all coated with protein, and some of the positive strand viruses are as well. It has no impact on infectivity of, of people. Okay, does that answer the question? Yes. Um, so what is a negative stain? A negative stain. So when you, you take a virus and you add these electron-dense materials like urinal acetate, phosphotungstate, when, a, when an electron hits those, it's repelled. So um, you're, you're staining negative, you're, you're shadowing a virus. You're not actually passing the electrons through it. You're, you're having them reflect and, and make an image on the film. That's why we call it a negative stain. Okay. Okay. Well, if two and three is correct. Um, most people got that. Oh, look, zeros on three and four. Now, one and two uh, are, have a problem here. Let's see. One, the bonding contexts are usually covalent. No, the opposite. Okay, they're not covalent. It makes sense. You wouldn't want to make a covalently bonded virus, right? These magnets would never come apart if you did that. So they have to be non-covalent. And each subunit has identical bonding contacts with its neighbors. That is correct, but it, it, ter it turns out that number three is also correct also. So I, I'm used to making questions for medical students. This is what you have to do for them. So it gets tricky at times. So if one thing is right, you've got to be careful, because if something else is right, you have to look for the, both two and three. I know more than half of you want to go to medical school, so you might as well use, get used to um, answering the questions. These are the kind of questions they put on exams and on the boards and so forth. Okay, so those are rod-shaped viruses. That's how you build them. Without an envelope for plant viruses, with for viruses that infect us. 
how do you make a round virus? And the question is, how do you make a round virus when proteins are not round? They're irregular. They're all different shapes. So here's a, a spherical virus in the EM. How do you build that with uh, proteins that are irregular? Well, the first clue is that all round capsids, and this was only found out by studying viruses, all round capsids have precise numbers of proteins. Multiples of 60 are common. So they can have 60, 180, 240, 960, and so forth. So people found this out, and they said this has to be important. And clue two is that spherical viruses come in many sizes. But a typical capsid protein is only a certain size, 20 to 60 kilodaltons. So you can make some small viruses or some really big ones, but the capsid proteins that make them up are all pretty much the same size. So how can you do that? Well, some people thought about this a long time. Uh, Casper and Klug in particular, and they got a Nobel Prize for this work, which came about in 1962. And they figured out how to build round viruses from proteins that are smallish and uh, of different shapes. So again, they knew from Watson and Crick's work that round capsids are icosahedrons. Platonic solids uh, were used only to, to con construct viruses and only icosahedrons. And finally, uh, they knew that the capsid subunits are arranged as hexamers and pentamers. All right, so what does this all mean? So it turns out that round viruses are built using icosahedral symmetry. They look like this platonic solid known as an icosahedron, which is a solid with 20 faces, and each face is an equilateral triangle. So here's an icosahedron right here, a drawing of it. Uh, I have a wonderful glass one that I got for Christmas, but I didn't want to bring it to show you today because it, the weather is too crappy, but it would have been perfect. Right? It's this little terrarium. Uh, so you're going to have to imagine it. All right, so that's an icosahedron. You have 20 triangular faces. They're equilateral triangles. And that, it turns out, lets you make a closed shell with the smallest number of identical subunits. You can make one of these shells with 60 proteins. You can make 60 of the same protein, you can make one of these shells. And no other platonic solid can do this and also be very stable. So probably that's why this was selected uh, during evolution. Uh, this is a symmetric repetition of subunits to give you this structure. And as a consequence, you get what are called axes of symmetry. There's a five-fold axis. And we can see, here's the top view of a five-fold axis. All that means is that there are five equilateral triangles around it. Uh, a three-fold axis is here. It's surrounded by the three sides of the triangle. And finally, there is a two-fold axis that's surrounded by two. These are just automatically created by the icosahedral symmetry, but uh, structural biologists use them as reference points. So I'll often say, near the five-fold axis, there's a binding site for this. So that's why I want you to, to know what we're talking about here. So that's how icosahedra are made. Um, I happen to have one here. Let me, I didn't bring my glass one, but I have these uh, plushy viruses, which you've probably seen. These are giant microbes. This is polio. And I mean, they put eyes in it to make them cute for kids, I suppose. But um, you can see there's a five-fold axis of symmetry here, right? One, two, three, four, five. There are five triangles around it. You can also find three and two-fold axes of symmetry. So this is actually pretty well constructed. All right, where's, uh, where's our magnet? Where did that go? Oh, it's over here. So this is a nice contrast. Here is a rod-shaped virus made up of capsid proteins. And this is also made of capsid proteins, but it makes a sphere. Okay, so that's polio. Now, an important concept here is T number, triangulation number. And this can be described in a couple of different ways. But the way I like to say it is the number of facets per triangular face of an icosahedron. So let's, let's go back to a triangular face. This is a triangular face. There are 20 of them that make up the icosahedron. The number of facets in that face is the T number. If there's one facet, the T number is one. If there are three, the T number is three. There's actually a mathematical way to calculate this if you're confused by this facet idea, which I find the mathematical approach more complicated to learn, and I don't want you to do that, but it is in the textbook if you're interested. But the simplest way is to say the number of facets per face uh, is the T number. And here we have T equals 1. Here are two 
uh, equilateral triangles, triangular faces opposed, and these have one facet. You'll have to take my word for it. Even though there are three protein subunits in that face, they don't have, they're not three facets. There's one facet. Uh, and then this one, here is the triangular face right here from fivefold to fivefold axis. Those are the, the green pentagons. One, two, three, four. There are four triangular fa facets here, which are designated by the dotted line. So the T number for this is four. All right. Um, so that, that basically is what a T number is. And the reason it's important is because this is how you make bigger viruses. So the simplest virus is a T equals one with one protein repeated 60 times. If you want to make bigger viruses, you don't use bigger proteins. What you do is you add facets to each triangular face. So you can see you go from T equals one to T equals four, you can make a bigger virus particle because now the triangular face is bigger. And when you do that, when you get bigger than T equals one, you now have a six-fold axis of symmetry. So the viruses we've talked about so far, the polio and the icosahedral, the basic icosahedral, have five-fold axes of symmetry. But when you start adding proteins and increasing the T number, anything over one, you have now a six-fold axis of symmetry, in addition to five-fold. And I, I think we have some pictures of that that I can show you. All right? So this is a simple icosahedral capsid, T equals one. It's made up of 60 identical subunits. That's the minimum number you need to make a closed shell like this. Uh, there's a single protein. It's both the subunit and the structural unit. So remember, the subunit is the protein chain, and the structural unit is the collection of change. But in this case, the, it's the same. The protein is the same as the, subunit, as the structural unit. In this type of capsid, interactions of all the proteins with their neighbors is identical. And that's sort of been shown here in a schematic way. The proteins are drawn as commas. And so you can see their head-to-head -head interactions and their tail-to-tail -tail interactions. So these interactions are identical throughout the particle. And this was one of the aspects of structure, the symmetry aspects that was learned in the 60s, that the proteins interact with each other in a symmetrical fashion. All right, so that's T equals one. Uh, here's an example of a T equals one virus, adeno-associated virus two. It's a parvovirus. These are single-stranded DNA-containing viruses that can infect people, that can infect your dogs and cats. It's about 25 nanometers in diameter. T equals one, a single capsid protein, which is shown up in the upper right here. That's the X-ray structure of it uh, that is repeated 60 times. So this is, these are arranged with icosahedral symmetry. But you see, this, this particle is spherical. So that is another important take-home message. Even though we use icosahedral symmetry to build the particle, it doesn't mean that they actually look like icosahedra. So you know, these lines here on this virus uh, wouldn't be there in the real life. You would, it wouldn't look like an icosahedron. It's really the way the proteins are arranged. So how do you make a bigger virus? You simply add more subunits. And here is a T equals 3 virus, where now we have three facets per triangular face of the icosahedron. Um, and now we, this, this virus happens to be made up of 180 identical protein subunits. So we've gone from 60 to 180. We've tripled the number of subunits, and we've tripled the number of facets per uh, equilateral triangular face. So you add more proteins, you make a bigger virus. You don't use bigger proteins. Here is when you now see uh, six-fold axes of symmetry. So we have five-fold in the simplest icosahedra. Uh, so here is a five-fold axis. One, two, three, four, five subunits around it. But now you also see there are six-fold axes of symmetry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. A little skewed up there, but that's a six-fold. And that gives you, that's what we also call a hexamer. A hexamer would be the subunit around a six-fold axis, and a pentamer would be the subunit around a five-fold axis. Now you can see right away, because we have hexamers and pentamers, the, the interactions among the subunits can't be identical anymore. There's no way, because the environment in a, in a pentamer is different from the environment in, in a hexamer. So we say that the, the interactions among the subunits are now quasi-equivalent. They're, they're similar, they engage in head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail, -tail, but there are differences within the particle so that we can no longer say that the interactions are equivalent. Now, 
remember, that was one of the tenets or one of the rules of symmetry, that you have equivalent interactions. And when Casper and Klug started studying bigger viruses, they realized that they violated their rules. So they made up kind of a, an extra rule. They called it quasi-equivalence, not necessarily equivalence. But, it, but the symmetry rules still pertain. So that's a larger uh, particle. So this is quasi-equivalent. When a capsid contains more than 60 subunits, each occupies a quasi-equivalent position. That is, they're generally head-to-head -head and tail-to-hail, but there are subtle chemical differences such that they're not identical. All right, so the, the, the binding properties are similar but not identical. Uh, let's explore this a little bit more. We start with a small virus, a T equals one, where the triangular face has one facet. So here is a subunit. Uh, here is one of the structural units. It's a pentamer, and that's the virus particle. This is T equals one. There's one facet per triangular face. Uh, here is a T equals three. One, two, three facets per triangular face. And this virus has gotten bigger. We've put more subunits into it. And then we have a, a T equals one, two, three, four. You just count this, the facets there which are drawn out for you, and this virus is even bigger. Okay, that's the T number and its relationship to uh, the size of the particle. So let's uh, go to Socrative. Which of the following characteristics of icosahedral symmetry are, are, are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry in viral capsids? everything all of the above is number five so let's see what we got here Laptop. so they're all correct so those of you who picked one that's correct but you have to pick all of them because they are all that's the right answer all of the above and those are things that we talked about all right so these are basic spherical viruses with icosahedral symmetry uh, but it turns out that things can get more complicated. You can add other proteins. And there's a bunch of viruses that we call complex viruses, where you have the proteins that make up the icosahedral shell, but you also have other proteins as well with other functions. And um, these, these have different symmetries and they have different roles in the capsid. So here's an example for adenovirus, where the virus is made up of 720 copies of a protein called the hexon. All right, so that, it's, that protein by itself makes up the icosahedral shell. But virus particles also have all these other proteins as well. They have penton bases and fibers. Uh, they have proteins inside the capsid, uh, within the capsid, and so forth. They have a protein bound to DNA. And so this makes it more complicated. But these are not involved in the construction of the capsid. They have other functions in the virion. So in case you get confused by that, that's, that's what's going on. So here's an electron micrograph of adenovirus. It is an icosahedral. It's built with icosahedral symmetry. It's rather large. Um, and it has these interesting projections at each five-fold axis of symmetry. It's 150 nanometers in diameter, quite large. It's at t equals 25. It has 20 facets per icosahedral face. 720 copies of uh, protein 2, which is that hexon protein. At each five-fold axis, there's a fiber. So these yellow proteins make up the capsid of the particle. They're arranged with icosahedral symmetry. But at each five-fold axis, you have a penton base, or a penton composed of a penton base and a fiber. And it's one of those at each five-fold axis. And there, the arrangement of the 
capsid subunits is, is a pentamer. It's a five-fold axis by definition. But all the other hexons are arranged in units of six, around six-fold axes of symmetry. So this is what happens, again, when you make a bigger virus, you get both five and six-fold axes of symmetry. You can also see there are other proteins interspersed uh, among the hexons. These are thought to be glue, basically, that hold the, uh, better, are better suited to hold the hexons together. There are a couple of proteins bound to the viral DNA uh, that, that help it get into cells. And there's also a protease inside the capsid. So in addition to the basic units, the basic proteins that make up a capsid, many of the bigger viruses have other proteins in them as well so that they can carry out uh, their life cycles. Here's another example of a complicated virus. This is real virus. These are viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes in segments. And what's unusual here is that these viruses have two icosahedral shells. There's an inner shell whose structure is shown here, and then there's another shell on top of it. And that's diagram here on the left schematically. The uh, beige subunits here are the inner shell, and the purple ones are the outer shell. So both are made with icosahedral symmetry, it's just that one is wrapped around the other. Now you may say, why do you do this? Do you want to make the virus more stable? It turns out this has to do with the way the virus gets into cell, and we will talk about this quite extensively later on. You can see that these viruses also have other proteins besides the structural ones that make up the capsid that are part of the virion. For example, these uh, special proteins at the five-fold axis. This is called the turret and there's a receptor binding protein there. It's very much like the adenovirus situation, but they don't project out as much. So the underlying symmetry is, again, icosahedral with additions to serve the viral functions. All right, so those are examples of viruses with icosahedral symmetry. Many of them are naked. That's the particle as you see it. Right here is, this is poliovirus, and, and that's all there is to it. But for many other viruses, uh, including helical ones, as I told you, there can be an envelope around this. It's always virus specific, it doesn't vary. So polio doesn't sometimes have an envelope and other times not. Polio never has an envelope, whereas other viruses with, uh, with icosahedral cores can always have the envelope, depending on the virus. The envelope is a bilayer derived from the cell. And that's again, because the virus can't make lipids. And the envelope is acquired by budding through a cellular membrane. The viral components assemble under the membrane, induce the formation of this bud, which eventually pinches off to form the virion. So that membrane that the virus has around its nucleocapsid, that membrane is acquired uh, from the cell. And it can be any cell membrane, plasma membrane, ER, Golgi, even nuclear membrane. But again, it's always the same. If influenza has a plasma membrane derived envelope, which it does, it's always the same. It doesn't vary. Uh, for influenza virus. And again, nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly inside of the envelope. It can be helical, as we've talked about, or it can be icosahedral. So either one can be inside and be called a nucleocapsid. Yes? What do you mean by it's always the same? It's always the same in geometry and structure? No, so what I mean is that influenza virus acquires, the question is, what do I mean by it's always the same? Influenza virus acquires its envelope at the plasma membrane. That is always true for influenza. It doesn't sometimes get it from the nuclear membrane or from the ER or anywhere else. So it's invariant for the specific virus. Here are some examples of enveloped viruses of different sorts. On the upper left is, uh, is, is a rhabdovirus, VSV, or rabies virus. And again, the nucleocapsid protein uh, bound to RNA, like our magnetic beads there, is wrapped up in an envelope. Uh, on the right is Ebola virus. It's a larger version than we saw before. This is, again, a helical nucleocapsid envelope. Here the envelope is very unusual. It's filamentous. We'll talk about that, how, how that happens later. So helical nucleocapsid for rhabdoviruses, helical nucleocapsid for um, Ebola viruses. Uh, here on the lower left is a flavivirus. This is also an envelope virus. Examples are West Nile virus, yellow fever virus. This has an envelope, as you can see here, the blue uh, material. But its nucleocapsid is icosahedral. So the viral RNA is encapsidated in an icosahedral particle. It's almost as if you took poliovirus and put an envelope on it. 
Right, that's what these flaviviruses look like here. So the envelope can be around a helical nucleocapsid or an icosahedral nucleocapsid. When there is an envelope in the virion, or I should say when the virion has an envelope, it always has viral proteins in it. And these are called viral envelope glycoproteins. They are integral membrane, transmembrane glycoproteins, and they have an ectodomain, a transmembrane domain, and a uh, part of the protein that's inside the virus particle. So this is a close-up view of the viral membrane. This is outside the virus, and this is the inside of the virus. So these integral membrane proteins typically span the membrane. The external part is used to attach to cell receptors. It's used to fuse to cell membranes, as we'll see. And it's also the part of the virus against which antibodies are made when we respond to them with an immune response. And the internal part of these proteins has to do with assembly. They're often oligomeric on the, on the virus surface. And so if you take EM pictures of them, you can see very distinct assemblages, like here in this influenza virus uh, EM. You can see spikes. And those are trimers of a single glycoprotein. And uh, that's where the word spike comes from, from the morphology of these. These envelope glycoproteins can be perpendicular to the membrane of the virus. Here's a viral membrane. Here's the influenza virus glycoprotein, which, by the way, is called the HA or hemagglutinin. You can see it's perpendicular. So when you look at virus particles, the EM I just showed you, you can see that they're, that they're perpendicular to the membrane. And this is a model of the virus. The blue uh, and red are the viral glycoproteins. You can see they're perpendicular to the viral membrane. On the other hand, some of them are horizontal. They lie flat against the viral membrane. An example is the glycoprotein of the flaviviruses. So you can see distinctly different orientation compared to influenza virus. And on the virus, here's a cryo-EM reconstruction of a flavivirus. You can see how these glycoproteins are lying down on the virus surface. Now you may wonder why that is. Why aren't they all sticking up? And you know, the answer again to why questions is because it works. Um, here, the tip of the proteins are what engage cell receptors. And here, uh, there are surfaces of these proteins that can also engage cell receptors quite as well. So, you know, in our human thinking, it, it seems to us that a perpendicularly arrayed protein is the best, but it's not. Many other ways work. These viral glycoproteins that are stuck in the viral membrane, they transverse, they, they cross the membrane, and they typically interact with what's underneath. So here on the left is an example of how a viral glycoprotein can interact with a capsid. An icosahedral capsid is right underneath the membrane in this particular virus, and the glycoprotein is interacting with it. Uh, sometimes there's another layer of protein between the membrane and the capsid. It's called a ma matrix or M protein, uh, and that could interact with the glycoproteins. And some viruses have many layers of proteins between the nucleocapsid or, and the membrane. You can see there are three here. And the, the glycoproteins interact with the one that's closest to the membrane. So these glycoproteins have multiple roles in, in virus infection, as we'll see as we go into the infectious cycle. And they're complicated. They, just, they don't just sit in the membrane, but they also interact with what's uh, underneath. Now, envelope viruses, we divide into two broad classes, and one of them is called structured envelopes, and the other, as you might guess, is unstructured envelopes. So the structured envelopes are exemplified by Synbis virus, which is a member of this family Togaviridae, and this is a virus with T equals 4 icosahedral symmetry. So the virus is made up of a icosahedral particle or nucleocapsid wrapped in a membrane. And um, here you can just see the icosahedral shell. It's in blue here. And the nucleic acid's in the middle. And these are the viral glycoproteins. I'm sorry, the blue is the membrane. The uh, yellow greenish is the capsid. And the, the uh, purple is the, the viral glycoproteins. So the capsid, that yellow green structure, is made with icosahedral symmetry. And it has an envelope around it. If you look, if you do the structure of this virus, and here's this viral structure with its membrane, the glycoproteins actually look like they have icosahedral symmetry on the surface. There are five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. There are icosahedral faces. And that's because the glycoproteins interact with the underlying icosahedral capsid, and it gives them symmetry. Um, you can see, I think, here, here, look at this one glycoprotein. 
it is passing through the membrane and then it interacts with the capsid right here. And here is a, a different view of this. These are, uh, here's the RNA, here's the capsid, uh, and here's the glycoprotein going through the membrane. That's the membrane bilayer, layer one and two. And it's C-terminus is interacting with the capsid protein. So basically these viruses are structured because the capsid beneath the membrane gives the glycoproteins icosahedral symmetry. So that's an example of a structured virion. There are lots of unstructured envelopes. Mainly they have, uh, they have helical genomes within them, rhabdoviruses, influenza viruses, some retroviruses. They all have unstructured envelopes. The glycoproteins are not adhering underneath to an icosahedrally symmetrical capsid. So structured versus uh, unstructured envelopes. And our last question for today concerns viral envelopes. Which, which statement is correct about viral envelopes? Remember, if one is correct and there is another one correct, you have to be careful here. And look at the kind of question and figure out what's going on. Yes? Is envelope viruses formed by cutting from the membrane? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, if, if envelope virus is formed by budding from the membrane, does that mean that the membrane does not lyse? Uh, it, so initially, that's correct. The cells don't lyse because you want to make a number of virus particles from them. Uh, um, so the budding can go on for a number of hours before the cells actually die. And in fact, some cells never die. They just keep budding continuously. Interesting. One, two, three, four is the favorite, but everybody else except three is getting hits. So let's see what's going on here. What is, which statement is correct? They're always derived from the plasma membrane. That's not true. They could be plasma, ER, Golgi, nucleus, okay? They only surround icosahedral nucleocapsids. No, they can surround icosahedral nucleocapsids, but they can also surround these helical nucleocapsids. Do not contain embedded proteins, they do. There's never a naked envelope around a nuclear capsid. It always has to have viral proteins in it, otherwise it couldn't attach to cells. They are produced by budding, and, of, and number five, of course, is not correct. I want to tell you about a couple of other complicated viruses that are interesting. One is herpes viruses. We'll talk more about these later in terms of disease. These are rather large double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. They encode 80 genes. They have a total of 80 viral genes. Over half of those are dedicated to building this particle. So it costs a lot to make a big particle. 2,000 angstroms uh, in diameter. There are 13 different envelope glycoproteins. And the way the virion is made, there's an icosahedral nucleocapsid that's shown in light blue here. And the DNA genome is inside it. It's pretty much naked. There's no protein bound to it. And then there's an envelope around it that's shown in blue. And then the yellow are the viral glycoproteins that are embedded in the envelope. So there are a lot of different uh, yellow envelope glycoproteins. And then there's this orange protein between the capsid and the, and the membrane. It's called the tegument. This has a lot of proteins that the virus needs when it first infects a cell. Now herpes is, a, is an interesting complicated virus because it has a, a property that we haven't encountered yet. So they're built with icosahedral symmetry. So Everything is in similar positions. There are five and six-fold axes of symmetry, but one of the five-fold axes is different from all the others. Uh, and that's this one here. So here's the icosahedral particle. Here uh, in this view in the middle, uh, this is just the icosahedral particle, no membrane. The membrane's been taken off. You can see the five-fold axes are colored in red. But one of these is very different, and it's actually a portal. And you can see a reconstruction of it here on the right panel. Uh, it's actually a hole in the five-fold axis, and we think it's where DNA gets into the particle and how it gets uh, out of the particle as well. So it's built at one of the 12 five-fold vertices, and you can see the portal here in this reconstruction. So it's actually got a hole in it, whereas all the other five-fold axes are closed. So that's an interesting variation. Bacteriophages, 
are also built with the, prince, the same sim symmetry principles uh, that we've been talking about. And that is icosahedral capsids and helical capsids. But here, the DNA of this particular virus, this is one of the tailed bacteriophages, uh, the DNA is encased in this icosahedral head, and you should see right away that it's built with the principles of icosahedral symmetry. It has triangular faces, five-fold axes of symmetry. Uh, here's a different kind of reconstruction of it. Uh, but it's also got a contractile tail, and the tail is made using helical symmetry. And when these attach to cells, uh, they bind at the base plate. Some of them contract to inject the DNA through, from the head uh, through the tail into the organism. And you can see this is a, uh, a reconstruction of the head, as I said, but at the bottom, the base plate is a very complicated assembly of different proteins. Each, one, each color is a different protein that makes up uh, that base plate. So again, an, an example of a complex virus particle, but nevertheless, the, um, the symmetry rules are used that we talked about with additional proteins added. Now this, this base plate is very interesting. Um, these, these phages have to puncture the bacterial membrane to get through it. And there's a very interesting assembly at the bottom of the base plate. It's called a spike. And so here's an, an underview of uh, the base plate. Um, and here is this spike. And the idea is when the phage sits down on the E. coli, the spike is rammed through the membrane. It makes a hole. And then the DNA comes through the hole into the cell. And recently, the structure of this spike was solved. And that's shown on the right here. And this was solved by x-ray crystallography, so we can trace the alpha carbon backbone, as you can see here. And what I find amazing is that this actually looks like a spike. So this protein is made up of a series uh, of beta sheets. You can see here, there's a, there's a little uh, disordered structure at the top. Uh, but then there are anti-parallel beta sheets here forming most of the body of this spike. And it gets narrower as you go down. And then at the bottom, there is a molecule of iron uh, that is coordinated with uh, several histidine molecules that probably holds this spike together. So it's called an iron-loaded spike. And the idea, again, is that this jams into the membrane. So I'm just amazed at how the structure of this actually uh, follows its function. I think I have one more, OK, one more slide. And I want to show you another. I forgot to bring out my last. Um, virus particle here. And I wanted to make a comment. This is an HIV virion, OK? And it has the red uh, ribbon right there. It has eyes also. So HIV is enveloped. And you can, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a five-fold axis of symmetry here. It's made to look like an icosahedron. And I, I, can that ever happen with a virus, that an enveloped virus looks icosahedral? Yeah, I, I told you it could happen. But not with HIV. HIV is not a structured particle. It's an unstructured envelope. It just looks spherical with glycoproteins in its envelope. So this, I don't know, if you guys ever work for this company one day, could you make them fix this to get it right? Or if you work for any company that makes virus stuff, at least you'll know uh, what's right and what's wrong. So it, the, the structure of this isn't quite right. But again, it's fine if you want to make people aware of viruses. But I think you should do it in the right way. It's not so hard to do that. All right, so we talked about the structural proteins that make up helical capsids, uh, icosahedral capsids. We've said that with bigger viruses, you put extra proteins in to do different functions. And there are also, even in small viruses, though, there are extra proteins that I haven't told you about that are not necessarily structural, but which we will come back to here many times. There are lots of enzymes in viruses. Uh, there are polymerases, as you know. There are enzymes that integrate DNA into genomes. There are proteases. Uh, poly A polymerases, enzymes that cap mRNA, topoisomerases. And here's an example of a HIV virion, uh, which has an envelope and a nucleocapsid, and a, 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 uh, well, it's possibly an icosahedral nucleocapsid, but it doesn't give any order to the envelope. And you can see there are many different proteins within it a nucleocapsid, integrase, protease, reverse transcriptase, et cetera. They have many other proteins involved with uh, mRNA degradation proteins you need for efficient infection. And then cellular components can be captured into virions like histones, tRNAs, meristate, lipid, cyclophilin A, and many more. And we will be touching on some of these as we go through the, uh, 
specific steps uh, in the virus life cycle. All right.